the rest of the psalm, and I didn't expect to go this long, is a, is a prayer um, for restoration. And I can tell you right now, I did not look this up. I, I did not look this up, and I never have. But I can tell you <laughs> exactly what you'll find in most critical commentaries at this point. I can tell you exactly. I've not looked it up. I'm just predicting, and I'm 99% certain that I'll be right. There will be many who will say that verses 13 and following are a later edition. Why? Because the preceding portion of the psalm seems to be rather consistent in and of itself. And then the last part is a prayer for deliverance and blessing, which I think a lot of people would say, see, couldn't let it be such a downer, so it had to be later on. It was like, you know, that one that one there, before we put it in there, let's spice it up a little bit and make it better. So I can just guarantee you that's probably what's there. And there's one other hint as to why that would be um, theorized. Like I said, I, I've not looked it up. But do return, O Yahweh. Yahweh has not appeared in the preceding portion of the psalm. And so in light of what's called the JEDP theory, Yahwist, Elohist, Deuteronomist, Priestly theory, the, the, the uh, Graf-Wellhausen hypothesis, um, this would be since Yahweh didn't appear in the preceding part, appears here, that means it's added on, right? I mean, that's what you're, that's what you're taught in seminary. I was listening in seminary. <laughs> Even when I didn't agree, I was listening. I wanted to understand what was being said. Um, here's the problem. This is the first place that Yahweh appears in the psalm. And I think that it first appears here because this is God's covenant people asking for his covenant blessings based upon their repentance. Up to now, you have general statements that are true of humanity as a whole. Now you have the covenant people of God saying, how long will it be? And be sorry for your servants, your, your, uh, your avod. So satisfy us in the morning with your loving kindness. Now we're talking about chesed. There is, there is your term right there. Uh, that is, um, notice the Greek Septuagint is Elias mercy. There are numerous Greek terms that are used, and you have to use numerous Greek terms because chesed is such a wide-ranging, beautiful word. Anybody who tells you that the God of the Old Testament is not a loving and merciful God does not understand the term chesed. They just, they just don't understand it. We translate covenant faithfulness. It's normally translated in most of our English translations as loving kindness. That's not the best translation, but we're sort of used to it. Uh, but even loving kindness is actually two words that are very similar to one another slapped together to try to cover a wide range, the wide range that chesed actually communicates to us. And that goes with the use of the name Yahweh. Oh, Yahweh, return, satisfy us in the morning with your chesed, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days you have afflicted us and the years we have seen evil. Let your work appear to your servants and your majesty to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and confirm for us the work of our hands. Yes, confirm the work of our hands. This is the people of God, the covenant people of God, praying to Yahweh and relying upon his chesed. Um, and so I think it uh, is belongs right where it is once you recognize the shift in the focus. But I can guarantee you, I, I could find somebody, just in my commentaries I have here in the program, uh, that would uh, take it the direction that, they, uh, that I mentioned in saying that this is somehow a, uh, a later addition. Teach us to number our days. We may present to you a heart of wisdom. Got plenty of time to be doing that right now. Um, but these are words that are true to every generation. And these are words that are true for Christians 
during the plague, Justinian's plague, the bubonic plague. This was true for Christians in periods of great prosperity and in times of great want, during times of war and times of peace. How much, just ask yourself, how much do you want to present to God a heart of wisdom? If you're constantly suppressing the reality of your own mortality, the bre brevity of your life, that wisdom will always be hobbled. It will never be a wisdom that transcends this life. So how much do you want it? There, I mean, there are a lot of people that will do incredible things, something they really, really want. I feel really, really badly, I really do, for the Olympians who have been training and training and training for the Olympics. I have a feeling the time for the Olympics is going to come and everything is just going to be, there's going to be no concerns about any diseases at all, but it's still not going to happen. It's been put off. Once you pull the trigger, it's done. That's, that's my feeling. We'll see if I'm right. Um, but I feel sorry for them because, I mean, the training that those people go through uh, for the Olympics, uh, many of them are just heartbroken right now. Just absolutely heartbroken. So let me ask a simple question before I go on to another topic. How many of us as believers are ever heartbroken by how unwise we are before God all the time? Constantly having to ask him, forgive me for having been so foolish yet once again. How much do we want it? Are we willing to be disciplined to obtain it? Is the question. Psalm 90, prayer of Moses. I'm, uh, I'm glad we still have these, uh, these words of wisdom. I'm sorry? Oh. It's an interesting question. Uh, I'll read it for you. I've heard Chesed described as a conceptual counterpart to Agape as a revelation of God's love, Agape revealing that there's nothing we can do to earn the love of God, Chesed revealing that there is nothing we can do to lose the love of God. Comments? I just wonder why I never see these things uh, on uh, on Twitter. Um, bugs me to no end. Uh, is that addressed to me? Yes, it is. It'll, it'll probably show up in about two minutes in your feed, right? <clears throat> That's the way yeah, I, because works. I just I just hit refresh and there is absolutely positive, nothing there. Nothing there. There's there's nothing there, and that just uh, really bugs me. Yes, um, that uh, Twitter is so unreliable along those lines. Um, I don't get it. Uh, so I can't I can't read it. Uh, so I can't really respond to it. Um, uh, but what I heard you saying goes way beyond any uh, lexical definition of uh, Chesed. And for something to be that uh, specific and complex would require a specific context, far more than you'd ever get from a simple usage of the term. So be very, very careful. Um, there, there are people who will, especially on Old Testament terms, expand them way, 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 way out there. Um, chesed is a beautiful term. And could it be placed in a context like that? Yeah. But the word itself, just by itself, doesn't carry all of that stuff in it. That, that's well beyond um, what you'd ever find in any meaningful lexical source. Um, and you would have to have a context to um, get it to that level of specificity. And um, so, yeah, no, maybe if uh, Twitter decides to actually show that to me at some point in time, uh, that would be that would be useful, but uh, I've scrolled through all this stuff here and uh, and my mentions. See, I just don't get it. I I, I just don't do not understand. It makes me wonder if if this shadow banning stuff isn't uh, quite true because I I'm I've just refreshed everything and there is absolutely nothing addressed to me that says anything like that. So. Um, Unless it's from somebody I've muted, <laughs> which is possible. There was there was actually somebody I, I forgot to unmute. There was somebody, uh, oh yeah, that was doing an interview 
and their program was automatically sending out tweet after tweet after tweet after tweet every time someone would donate to them on YouTube. And so I finally had to mute them because it's like it was clogging up my entire feed with stuff that I had zero interest in. And uh, I've got to remember to try to go back in and unmute uh, that it were. But um, <laughs> someone do I did see this one. Uh, so Dr. Oakley, 1689's comment that during the Middle Ages, most peasants never traveled further than seven miles from our home would be stupendous for containment now. That's actually not just peasants. That's everybody. Artists, scholars, everybody didn't travel more than seven miles from our home. 